had some important politician fail on her at the end. She was the bottom of the barrel. She brought me out and being on the library board, um, volunteered for these things, and uh, I don't know how I got those to you, but I guess you know. Uh, but for the library, uh, before I get started, I think we have probably one of the finest libraries in the country. Yeah. Uh, this is a great job, and um, uh, we appreciate the taxpayer support that we get from the library, from you folks, from the city. And we are currently going to be meeting a new board member. Uh, one of our board members is going off before we return in December. So if any of you folks, I just got to talk to you about that, you know. If any of you folks, are at all interested in participating in the library board. The uh, mayor's office has applications, and we would certainly like to entertain uh, any and all people who are going to be. Um, my wife's appointment to help to tell me this mic is working. Oh, it is, baby. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if any of you are interested in, in um, uh, serving on the library board, please fill out an application to the mayor's office. And uh, we'll see if we can put you to work. Uh, I'm no, no means a public speaker. Uh, so don't be, uh, I hope you didn't come to, to hear professional speech or that. I am not. So I'll try and, and fumble through this. Um, I see Mary and Bernie here. I know they've climbed Kilimanjaro. Has anyone else in the room climbed Kilimanjaro? Does anyone have plans to climb Kilimanjaro? <laughs> Have one person going. Uh, I'm often asked, you know, the title, Do It While You Can. How did I come up with that? And also, um, why did I climb Kilimanjaro? Uh, I'm a firm believer to travel while your health permits you to travel. And um, I tell my wife often and my daughters often that I'd rather travel now job affords me the luxury to be able to get, a, get away when I can and for however long I want. And I'd rather be sitting in an old rocking chair, uh, when I'm old and gray, I guess I'm gray now, um, and think about the places I've been and opportunities I took advantage of, rather than sitting in an old rocking chair wishing I would have, could have, and didn't. So that's why I, I do a fair amount of travel around the world, both of my daughters, uh, fortunately, are extremely smart. They got their smarts from their mother. I agree. And, <laughs> and they've traveled the world for their education and, and their current jobs, so I tend to follow them around. They've never been to Kilimanjaro, or I hadn't been there because of them. But uh, because uh, of the experiences I've had traveling with those two young women, it's just opened up my eyes to do something maybe a little more extreme. Uh, Probably two things, three things, convinced me to do it. I know Mary and Bernie did it. I knew nothing about Kilimanjaro. I was impressed with that. Uh, I'm in the flooring business. I was in a customer's home. The woman was 81 years old, and she had just gotten back from climbing the Kilimanjaro. I was impressed with that. And uh, I had a good friend who lived in Spearfish. He did it with his brother and sons, and they had some you know, amazing stories about their experience. So I decided if I was going to do this trip, I wasn't going to do it by myself. My wife had no desire at all to do this. And my oldest daughter had the flexibility to do it. So I asked her if she wanted to do this with me. And uh, she said she would. For you people who don't know me well, I dislike camping. And this is seven days of camping. And I dislike the cold weather. And my wife asked me many times, why are you doing this? Two things you hate the most in life and you get experiencing. So it was a mental game for me to see if I could put up with the camping, uh, put up with the cold weather, and, and climb uh, Kilimanjaro. I'm an avid runner, and I thought that would be a huge advantage in climbing Kilimanjaro. And our head guide, when I was trying to book this thing, he says, We really don't want runners on these trips because he said, You guys want to go real fast. And he said, If you go real fast, you're not going to make it. So that was surprising to me that that's how uh, they, they view the runners. So uh, you walk at a very slow pace from the beginning to the top. They want a slow, steady pace. And um, that's what we did. And it, it seemed to work. Uh, 
just some, some real quick miscellaneous facts before we get started. Uh, Kilimanjaro is Africa's highest mountain. Uh, it's the highest freestanding mountain in the world, meaning it's not connected to any large mountain. It's just its own peak. And so it's the highest freestanding mountain in the world. The summit is uh, about 19,300 feet. Uh, the best months to climb Kilimanjaro are January through March or June through October. Uh, about 35,000 people attempt to climb uh, Kilimanjaro every year. 25% of those climbers are U.S. citizens. Um, I took what they call the Rongai route, which is a, a longer route, and you go at a much slower pace, and um, you acclimate, you come back down, you, you climb the next day, you acclimate, you come back down. They kind of want to make sure you're going to make it to the top. And so with that route, about 65% of the people uh, make it to the top. Uh, shorter routes that go more direct, go at a faster pace, have a much less success rate uh, than the longer routes. Um, three to seven people die each year attempting to climb. It's not because they fall off of the cliff or anything, it's they have heart attacks or other health related issues settling and uh, cause of death. I thought this was interesting. The fastest ascent up Kilimanjaro was a man who ran up, ran up and back in six hours and 42 minutes. It took me six days. So I can't figure that one out yet. The youngest climber to do Kilimanjaro was seven years old. And the oldest climber uh, is 85 years old. And I could be wrong on this, but I think I read someplace where that 85-year-old was a female, and I think she's from Rapid City. So that's a little bit of history, a little bit of facts about Kilimanjaro. Uh, let's talk about Africa a little bit. My oldest daughter has a PhD from Stanford, and she specializes in African history, so I know a little bit about the continent. As you can see, Africa is huge. People don't realize how big Africa really is. It's uh, combined uh, 47 countries on the mainland, you count a few of the islands off the coast of the countries, there's 53 countries in total in Africa, and there's about 1.5 billion people on the continent of Africa. <clears throat> this is Africa again, and I wanted you to see if it works. That's where that's where uh, Tanzania is, and of course that's where Kirtan Charles is. Um, got some map of Tanzania. You can see Kilimanjaro, the, uh, probably more center of the map in the right corner. Uh, Tanzania has about 47 million people. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. A third of the population is Christian, a third is Muslim, and a third is miscellaneous religions. And uh, primary languages are English and Swahili. Um, one of the advantages of traveling with my oldest daughter, she's fluent in French, and a lot of people in Tanzania speak French, and she's also fluent in Arabic, so when we go places, she can pretty much communicate with anybody, and I'm along to pay all the bills. <laughs> uh, one of the gentlemen asked me earlier, uh, how, how do you get to you know, this part of the world? I met my daughter in Paris, and from Paris, we took a direct flight to Arusha. Arusha is in Tanzania. That's kind of the city where people would arrive in preparation uh, for the climb uh, up Kilimanjaro. <clears throat> this map is basically from the top down showing you the many routes uh, that you can take uh, to get to the top. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar, familiar with Lonely Planet, a travel book. Uh, there's a book very similar to that about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, and it will explain to you all the routes, um, temperatures, uh, all the, the, the travel companies, all the hotels, the stadium, and, and, and everything you need to do to plan a trip uh, up Kilimanjaro. Um, I don't know what Mary and Bernie did, but there's a lot of different companies you pick from. You can go budget, 
where you take a more direct route, you do your own cooking, you bring your own tent, you might have one or two porters, and that's cheap, but it's uh, not, very, not very smart, because it's more dangerous, and if you aren't in good physical shape, you need to go slow. You can take a high-end hike up to the hotel, <laughs> where they furnish everything, I've been told they even carry a human oxygen tent, so if you need oxygen on the, on the climb, they'll put you in the tent right away. They cook you gourmet meals, and uh, it's kind of a five-star when you get to the top. I took a three-star plan, and with that type of a plan, you uh, produce your own sleeping equipment. You need a, a good water sleeping bag, sleeping mat. Uh, I was, was buying equipment and went to Shields, and I think I was probably one of their largest purchases ever because I bought all the equipment there. Um, you need uh, walking sticks, uh, you need a water purifier, you need multiple layers of clothing, and um, um, the lower, uh, the, the, higher, the higher rent companies will finish you all that stuff, but I wanted to collect some of that stuff for whatever reason myself. So I took the, the, the middle of the, of the road package, and um, I, I think for, my, for me and my daughter, that probably fit us. We had to camp, of course, outside. Uh, we set up tents for us. Um, the, higher, the higher rent ones, there was even lodges kind of along, there little cabins along the place that they would push in that had heat and all that, and we didn't uh, take advantage of that. Um, That's Solomon, and I uh, got to learn to respect that man. He was our head guide. When you uh, do these trips, um, uh, my wife, my, my daughter and I got to Arusha two days before the climb. We wanted to kind of acclimate, get a feel for the land and the people. And the night before you leave, this was our head guide, Solomon. He comes, and he wants you to lay all your gear out. He wants to know what you have. He asks you a lot of health questions and uh, wants to know if you have any you know, health issues. Uh, I'm convinced his sole purpose is there is to determine can I get along with these people and do I want to take them up the mountain. And he was a very kind man. He spoke um, so so English. You could understand him, but as we get further into the slides, um, you learn that you, to depend on this guy. I mean, this guy is the one who, who makes you realize are you going to get up and back in one piece in a lot. He, he's really responsible for your well-being. Um, when you climb the mountain, uh, at least in our trip, uh, Mary Bernie, if you have any comments, pipe up back there. Uh, each hiker had three porters. The porters are people who carry all your gear. Um, you buy a big backpack, you put all your gear in it, and then you want a day pack. And the porters carry your big backpack, they carry the tents, they carry the cooking utensils, they carry the latrine, they carry the food, they carry the water. And these people uh, are paid about $10 a day, and they work, work their uh, tail off for you. And again, you put your life in their hands. And uh, uh, at the end of the trip, you're supposed to tip them, and I don't think you can tip these people enough because of what they, they provide for you. So each hiker has about three porters to carry your gear up there. Then in, in, our, in our group, the night before we left, Solomon asked us if we wouldn't, uh, if, if we would allow a woman from England who was there, she was wanting to climb the mountain and she didn't have anyone to go with. So my attitude is always the more the merrier. So we uh, had her come with us. So we each have three porters, then each group has their own guide. You have a head guide, you have a cook, and you have uh, someone whose sole job, I found this amazing, was to be in charge of the latrine. And I asked Solomon, I said, well, he's probably the lowest paid guy. He says he makes uh, the most of anyone except the head guide. He says that's probably the most important job we have on these hikes. So I thought that was kind of, kind of an interesting <laughs> um, we climbed Kilimanjaro, they came to our hotel real early in the morning, a motel, and they had this huge, big, beat-up bus. Eight o'clock, we went out there. Uh, these guys look pretty rough. 
They don't have a lot of uh, clothes, beat up old shoes. And again, like I said, you're putting your hand, your well-being in, in them. Uh, you drive for about three or four hours to the park headquarters. There you have to register, and they have to uh, let the park people know, you know who's going, how long we're going to be up there, what route we're taking, and that type of thing. Then after you register, you climb back into the bus, and they take you to a drop-off point. It was unclear to me really what happened here. After the fact, I asked all of them what this was all about. And uh, this is, again, where the porters have to sign in, uh, saying what, what uh, group they're with. Uh, they kind of find a determination here and who's actually going to take the climb and uh, kind of assign themselves to uh, each of the the uh, hikers. <clears throat> While we were waiting, Solomon brought us this fine dish of food to keep us entertained and nourished a little bit. And then this is the porters uh, getting ready to uh, go up the mountain. They uh, carry the stuff on their heads, on their backs. Um, like I say, all we would carry was basically uh, a day pack. <coughs> Um, when you start out in, at the bottom of Kilimanjaro, I don't know if Mary and Bernie referenced this or felt this, but you kind of go through four seasons. You got to have shorts because it gets hot. You got to have a lot of rain gear. You got to have fall weather gear like we're experiencing here. And you got to have uh, winter gear. So you got a lot of clothes that you're packing on. Severe uh, winter gear. Pardon? Severe winter. Severe winter gear, yes. And, uh, my daughter and I, as we hiked up, we said often in the early stages, it's almost like hiking Harney Peak. I mean, the, the, the ground cover was very similar, the terrain was very similar, and we all thought, you know, this is going to be a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> we got started, uh, we got started late in the day for some reason. We got held up at park headquarters, and it was getting later in the day, so Solomon told the three of us just to take off. Here's the path, follow the path. So we just walked at our probably accelerated pace, and we're, we're getting pretty far pretty quick. Uh, we stopped once here for a little bit of a, a snack. You can see it's very mild climate, short sleeves. We don't have any uh, heavy gear with us yet. Those trekking poles, uh, I never thought those would be real important, but the higher you get, the more you depend on those. That's a quick picture of Solomon, Jennifer, the woman from England who joined us, and myself. Uh, this was our first night's base camp. Um, we walked so fast, the three of us, that we didn't know where to stop, and we noticed these tents, and we actually beat our porters there. So we just kind of hung out while they set up camp. Uh, one interesting story, um, during the middle of the night, I uh, had to get up and go to the bathroom and put your headlamp on so you can see where you're going. And when I got out of the tent, there was the tallest, the biggest African man I have ever witnessed. <laughs> and he had a gun longer than he was tall. And it really scared me. So I went about my business and went back to bed. And I asked the Solomon the next morning, uh, you know, what's the scoop on this character? And he said, he's, he's our guard. He's there to protect us from animals and any robbers, thieves, that type of thing. Um, he was with us at the lower camps. Once we got into the high country, he didn't go anymore because I don't think thieves can take that type of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> and <animals probably> <clears throat> Um, this is just another picture, the morning before we left, you can see uh, Kilimanjaro uh, in the background there. This is just a typical path in the lower parts of, of the hike. Um, since I'm a runner, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape, my ankles never give me fits, my knees never give me fits, but for some reason the second day, my right knee on the outside just started talking to me. Started out gradual, the more we went, the, the more it hurt. I didn't want anyone to know I was in pain, so I just kept my mouth shut, tried not to limp. 
and it uh, almost got to the point where I would almost scream. I wanted to because it hurt so bad. And um, Solomon was walking behind me. And he said, Rod, what's your problem? And he said, I don't have a problem. He said, your right knee's hurting you, isn't it? So that's one of the things that, that he, could, he would do. He'd observe every move you made, making sure you're healthy, you're in good shape, you had any problems, let's talk about it. Wanted me to look at my knees, so I pulled my uh, slacks up, and he couldn't, you know, determine anything. He just hurt like hell. So he gave me some pain medication and an energy drink, and he says, hopefully that will help. And I woke up the next morning, and the pain was gone. So um, I don't know uh, what the problem was, but he was able to take care of it. <clears throat> so these next couple of slides here are just um, slides of. Um, different things we did. Uh, lower down, we would eat outside. And again, the porters, when, when you arrive at camp at night, your tents are set up, your sleeping bags are rolled out, uh, they have a food tent, we eat dinner, there's a table and chair in there at the lower levels with good weather, you ate outside. They'll have a bag of popcorn in there, they'll have some tea in there. And you sit around and relax. Uh, Solomon will come in and let you know where we've been, how far we've been, kind of give you an overview of where we're going to go the next day, what time he wants to get started, what we're going to see. Yes? Just a question. You're talking about lower level. How high up elevation were you at these lower level? Where do you think you were at this? Well, this was probably, I'll say four or 5,000 feet, something like that. Still in the tree line. I think it was higher than that. Think so? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I think you were 10 or 12 there. There? Got a minimum of 10. Yes. Um, was your group consisting of the three of you then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now there are, uh, you can go by yourself. You have to pay for a private group that costs a lot more. As we uh, walked up and as we got to the top, there were groups with porters and everything that were probably four or five hundred. I mean, oh. lots of people. So ours, ours was probably a much smaller group. But when we got to the top, it was like, I don't know if Mary and Brady witnessed that, but it was like Walmart at Christmas time. There was a lot of people. Um, so this is, this is uh, 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 I think, probably an evening or, or, or mid-afternoon, early afternoon meal. Um, like I say, if the weather gets cold, you go into the, the tent that they put up where they feed you <coughs> popcorn, tea every night. Uh, Solomon comes in and updates you and where you're going to go the next day, what time he wants to get up, wants to review your health, make sure you're doing all right. Uh, the woman on the right there is my daughter, and of course the woman on the left there is Jennifer. Uh, I learned a long time ago, probably my first lesson was when I went to college, my second lesson was when I visited my daughter in Mortania. If you get hungry, you can't be picky about food. And um, I probably ate things here that if my wife cooked tonight, I wouldn't eat. But if you're hungry and you need your nourishment, so you uh, pretty much eat what they set in front of you. It wasn't bad food, it's just things that I just typically would not take any appeal to uh, for food. Uh, the other thing that I think I forgot to mention is water, when you leave uh, Arusha, uh, they want you to fill up several water bottles. You can buy bottled water. And then as you hike up, they get water <coughs> out of streams and whatnot, and they purify it for you. I uh, was told to have a water purifier in case we needed that, but with the group we went, they took care of that for us, and every morning when we got up, they gave us a big uh, couple bottles of fresh water. The other thing that they did for us, when you got up in the morning, Kind of your wake-up call, uh, my personal guide would come to my tent and he said, time to get up, Mr. Rod, and he put down a big bucket of hot water so you could kind of give yourself a sponge bath, and he'd bring you a small bucket of uh, cold water, brush your teeth, and that type of thing. Uh, when you got to the camp at night, as soon as you got there, uh, you unloaded your sleep, your, your gray pack, and your tent, and they bring you again a big bucket of hot water uh, to freshen up. Um, my family and I, we kind of consider ourselves foodies. 
So uh, I just put some s slides here together of, of different types of food that we had. And uh, for the most part, it, it, was, it was really good food. Like I say, when you're hungry and tired, um, eat about anything. Um, they allow no alcohol on the trip, uh, no soda on the trip. It's just water and tea. And what what we ate is also what they, the cook cooked for the porters. So everyone got the same thing. Um, we always were trying to compare. I think we probably got a little more food than the porters, um, but uh, we all ate basically the same same menu every night. Um, sometimes the, I'll, right? I'll throw in something if you don't mind. Yep. So on our trip, they put the tea in a tent every time, every afternoon when you got there and every night. But one another thing they did for us, I don't know if they did this for you, we had soup every night. And we figured they're just trying to get fluids in us as much as they could to with the tea. But soup every night along with a huge um, um, or western style meal. But our porters would have their own meal. You must have paid more for your You know what? I was, <laughs> when you said you were three star, I thought we were three star, but as you described it, I bet we were four star. <laughs> you probably did pay more. Um, as, as you got higher, of course it gets colder, sunsets a little earlier, so quite often when you would get to camp at night, I mean it would be dark or almost dark, uh, have to have your headlamp on, and um, they want to get you fed right away, get you to bed right away so you can get up bright early in the morning. So you'd get into the food tent and they would have candles, a tablecloth, I mean you really tried to make it a real pleasant experience and, and we had a lot of fun when we were sitting there eating, we talked a lot, which we went through through the day and experienced. Uh, kind of a side note, Jennifer, the woman from England, was a really nice, amazingly smart person and one of the porters we found out was in love with her. So he was always trying to nurture a conversation with her even though he couldn't speak English. But all the other porters were always making fun of him. So our conversation between the three of us at night was, you know, what was he doing today? To this relationship? Uh, that's where the, all the food was cooked, that little tent. Um, he sat in there and he, they carried uh, propane and um, I don't know what was in that bucket on the left there with the spoon in there, but um, that's where all the food uh, came out of. And he had two of the other porters as he would cook food, uh, they'd bring it uh, to the tent. That's my daughter Erin um, washing up. I think that was probably some morning uh, she was. Uh, get yourself cleaned up before we hit the road. <clears throat> Again, like I said, as you get higher, um, the trees disappear. This was, I don't know, probably 13, 14,000 feet, maybe higher. Uh, it gets a little more uh, windier. It's a heck of a lot colder. Um, also, as you travel up, up the mountain, there are other companies, other hikers as well, so it appears there's certain spots where everyone kind of collects at night. And uh, everyone kind of stays together. Our group kind of would be in one part of a big area, another group would be in another part, another group in another part. Um, and like I said, we were probably one of the smallest uh, groups making the climb. Uh, that was an outdoor latrine uh, that they had built. Did you see that one, Mary and Bernie? Or? I, I, I remember something like okay. that. It's um, kind of icky inside. The way that was built, I chose to use the portable machine. I didn't want to, <laughs> want to go in there. I didn't know where I would end up. <laughs> um, this was uh, uh, two nights before we summited. Um, uh, that lake that we see there, it's basically a pond. Uh, used to be full prior to all the climate change. And every year it's getting smaller and smaller. Um, this afternoon we would have arrived there probably about two or three. And Solomon said, go uh, put your day packs away and we're going to go for a little hike. And um, 
he took us up about another thousand feet without our day packs, and we got up there, and he was just trying to acclimate us. And uh, I don't know the term for it, but he had us all put a gadget on our fingers that measured the oxygen level uh, for each of us, making sure that we were you know, in good shape, weren't having any <coughs> problems breathing. So we stayed up there for probably an hour, just uh, uh, inhaling uh, the wind, making sure that uh, we were all good to go. <coughs> That again is just another picture of my daughter and uh, Jennifer. Uh, as we're getting a little bit closer, you can see our uh, gear is getting a little more uh, plentiful and heavier. Uh, they really encourage you to dress in layers. So if you get too hot, you can take off one layer. And uh, as you go up, you just keep adding layers. Uh, that's the famous latrine. Inside of there was a, just basically a five gallon bucket with a wooden seat on it. And um, every morning after we all use it, the uh, guy who was in charge of that did something with what was in the bucket, I don't know. But uh, that was a, a pretty um, important place to know where that thing was located. Again, that's just another uh, picture of Kilimanjaro as we're getting closer. Um, it seems like the closer you got to it, uh, it doesn't make sense, the uh, steeper it got and the taller it got. Uh, and we all, as, as we looked at that every day, we always said, well, you know, will we make it? I never really had any doubts. Uh, like say, I, I consider I'm in pretty good physical shape. I was worried about the, the mental game with it and if I would have gotten injured, then I uh, would have been able to make it. Again, as you get higher, it turns into more of a moonscape. You can see the porters ahead of us carrying all the gear again. Uh, this was another time we got into camp, uh, probably mid-afternoon. Uh, the slide's a little bit out of order, but uh, again, another time we were, <coughs> were able to uh, enjoy a pleasant uh, snack. So my daughter Erin, again, as we're getting higher, you eat with all your gear on. Uh, the tent that you eat in, they don't heat by any means. Um, so uh, the last couple nights, as you get higher, it gets colder. Uh, you're eating with your gloves on, got your coat on, your hats on, uh, just trying to stay warm. <clears throat> uh, when you get up there high enough, of course, there's no, there's no trees. And this was an old water buffalo that Solomon tells us uh, was probably old and dying. And he wandered up there. I guess that's what some animals do. They want to get away from everyone and go someplace to die. He'd been there for quite some time. I'm saying a lot of years. But it's so cold up there. There's no other critters up there that he still had all of his fur. And he was kind of hollow. I don't know where all of his innards went. But um, because it's so cold up there, nothing would come up there. Solomon says an eating or, or get rid of him. So he's just kind of a landmark uh, for all the hikers. <clears throat> um, this was about, again, oh, two or three nights before the summit. Um, I actually thought this night was probably going to be my last night on the face of the earth. <laughs> really cold here. And, um, what kind of temperatures do you know or remember? Well, I'm going to say here it was probably 15 degrees, which isn't cold, but the wind was blowing, you know, 80 miles an hour. It was really cold. And um, to the right of that last tent, there was a huge ravine where it looks like when it rains, it was kind of where all the water runs. And we were pretty close to that. And so we got into to, you know, bed, and it started raining, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it, it rained hard. And I was, was convinced that all this water was going to fill up that ravine, and I was next the closest to it. I was going to get washed away. And then it started hailing really bad. And then I heard someone on the outside of the tent, a couple of the porters, were taking a rock and putting like a trough around the tent 
so I guess the water wouldn't collect there or something. But it, it was, uh, I didn't sleep well that night. I froze to death even though I had a really good sleeping bag. Um, I, that was probably the toughest night on the whole trip was that one. We got up the next morning though, the sun was shining, uh, the hail hadn't all disappeared yet. Um, that was just, like I say, for me the, the toughest night. <clears throat> As we left that morning, again, that's another picture of Kilimanjaro. Someplace in that picture, I tried to look at it the last couple days, there was the base camp that we were to stop at, but I could not find it. When we were there, uh, Solomon showed us where it was, but I couldn't find it uh, looking at it now. And um, this would have been the base camp, the last camp you stay, on, stay in before you uh, do the summit. It was probably warmer here than it was the place we just left. Um, if you pay the four star or five star price, you get to stay in that metal building. Um, we again just stayed in the tents. I looked in that metal building. I don't know if I would have wanted to stay in that building. It was not, not all that nice. They had some bunks in there, but uh, I think they had a little a propane heater. But uh, it wasn't that much better than, than our tents that we had. So, um, when we got to this point, uh, Solomon made us aware that the next morning we were going to summit the mountain <coughs> and we had to leave camp at midnight. So he encouraged us to get to bed early and we'd get up at 11 o'clock at night and um, eat breakfast and head towards the top of the mountain. I call this my last supper. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'd eat again after this. It was very good, very nourishing. That's Erin with her headlamp uh, eating. Uh, again, it was probably 15 degrees um, uh, temperature. Wind, wind was really blowing hard. So then the next morning, 11 o'clock that, that night, uh, we all get up at 11 and they, they, we ate that meal and uh, Solomon gets us all the line and we all had headlamps on. And fortunately, the, the night we made the summit, the morning we made the summit, it was clear sky, and the uh, moon was shining, and you really didn't need your headlamps, it was really bright. And so our instructions were just to follow the person directly in front of you, and only look at their feet, and turn your lamps off. Uh, it didn't make, didn't make sense to me. When you make the summit, the head guide goes, climbers who are paying the bill go, and each of our personal um, guides go with us. The porters don't make this last uh, part of the trip. So, uh, I mean, it was pitch dark out, but the moon lit our way, and I just, to myself, I thought, you know, why would we have our lights off? Uh, there's gotta be a reason. This was getting towards the summit. Um, as the moon, as the sun came up, and we were going up this path, I didn't take any pictures of them, but. There were people, hikers, laying along the side of the path who couldn't make it. There's one elderly woman laying there <coughs> clutching an oxygen tank. They were bringing people down on stretchers who either got injured or, or didn't make it. So I was kind of having second thoughts about this time. Um, the stretchers were amazing. If this was a stretcher, then down here, they just had one big bicycle tire. And so they put a body in there and try and balance that. And there was a big tire, so it would go over all the, the big boulders. As you get towards the top, there's no really path. I mean, there's not a set way to get there that I could determine. There's just a lot of boulders. And I think people who do it often know the landmarks. But there's no worn path that I saw. And you're just really taking huge steps up, up really large rocks to get there. Once you get towards the top, then there's a path that takes you uh, to the summit, and that's kind of where we were headed there. Um, that's a glacier at the top. Uh, I don't know what all of you uh, think about climate change. I'm a believer in it. They uh, tell us in 1912, the summit of Kilimanjaro was under 100 meters of ice. And um, this is what's left 
and they tell uh, the they told me when I was there in five years this will be gone and there won't be any more uh, ice on top of uh, Kilimanjaro. Uh, you see that to your left as you're heading towards the uh, the final summit, <coughs> and that's uh, myself on the right, the porter who was in love. Yeah. The woman on the woman to the extreme left, my daughter Erin, Solomon, and Jennifer. Uh, one of our other guides uh, got sick that, that morning and he couldn't make it to the top. Um, I don't know if Solomon was, was just wanting to get down, but he told us we could only stay at the top of the mountain 15 minutes because it's so high we're going to get short of oxygen and have problems. I think there was just so many people up there he's wanting to start the path down ahead of all these uh, other people, but there was literally a line, you know, when you hike up there, you see pictures, everyone wants to get their picture taken here, but there was literally, uh, it's like standing at a Ferris wheel in the, in the carnival, literally a line of people just waiting uh, to get your picture taken. Did they give you those jumpsuits? Were they jumpsuits that you wore at the end, the brown? No, that's all the equipment you buy yourself, yep. I bought a lot of equipment I'll probably never use again, so if anyone's going to go, contact me. <laughs> save us the money. Uh, one thing that my, my daughter, when I started running, told me, uh, she said, Dad, don't chimp on, you know, skimp on shoes. When you run, buy good quality shoes. And I've always done that. I never had problems with my feet. And I bought really good boots, and I was glad I did. I never had an issue with feet. Some of the, my daughter was, had a, a blister or two, Jennifer had some foot issues, uh, so I'm a firm believer when you take on something like this, uh, get good equipment. <laughs> That's Jennifer and the lover. <laughs> when, when, we, when we got to the bottom and, and dropped Jennifer off for the last time, uh, she was so nice. She went over and gave him a kiss. And he about melted in his seat. <laughs> um, so we turned around, got our pictures taken, and started a slow descent. Um, I soon learned why we turned our headlamps off. Um, if I would have known what we just walked through to get to the summit existed, I'll guarantee you I would not have gone there. Because coming down, uh, it was icy, same path, and there were probably areas that were two or three thousand feet straight down that we just walked over. So I think Solomon's intent was, don't let them see how bad it is until we start going down. But it, it was, I thought, for for someone who who's not a big climber, it was kind of dangerous um, on the way down. That's that's one of the spots there, all that snow and ice, and we went through quite a few. There was very narrow passages. And one misstep, I'll guarantee you, uh, you would have been dead. Once you get uh, past that uh, tough terrain at the top of the ice, things start happening pretty quick. Uh, it took us six days to get to the top and a day and a half to get down. And you just, you take a different route. When you go up, you go up slowly and wind a, a, around. When you come down, they take a much more direct route and uh, uh, go down pretty quick. Uh, unfortunately, going up that night, that early morning, I had all my gear on. Like I mentioned earlier, I hate the cold. I did not get cold, I was probably sweating. And I got hypo, uh, help me out here, Karen. Hypothermia? Yes, and I wasn't drinking enough water. And I got to the top fine, but as we started coming down, I started feeling pretty sick. And again, I didn't say much, but uh, every hour it was getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, we got down to uh, one of the camps where we stayed on our way down. We took a group picture of everybody. At this camp, there was probably three people that were spending the night there who arrived in stretchers. They had fallen or something on the hike. One was an old guy, probably I'll say 80 years old, 75, 80, and he just, I think, pooped out on the deal. I felt sorry for him. And they didn't know if he was going to make it or not. They got him out, uh, I think by ambulance or something. We found out later he, he was.
was doing all right. But this is our group picture that they took. I went to bed real early this night because I did not feel good at all. Um, this is again a, on our descent. Um, I mean, I had the dry heaves along here. I just was not feeling well. I just did not have enough water at the top. Um, Aaron was concerned about me. Um, this is me feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> um, and I, I just really felt sick. So Solomon um, asked me, he said, do you want a car to get us down? And we only had maybe a day's, half a day's hike down. I mean, it was all going to be flat level stuff. I made it to the top. I've seen what I want to see. I did not want to leave Aaron and Jennifer. And Aaron says, let's take the car. And Jennifer said, I'm all for taking the car. So they called him, which I thought was a car. <laughs> it happened to be an ambulance. And I saw this vehicle coming like a bat out of hell, really fast, no sirens or anything. I think they thought I was probably on death's bed. But uh, we jumped into the ambulance, and then they took us down to the park headquarters. And uh, I thought it was amusing as soon as we got there. We got out, they threw our gear out, and away he drove. He really wasn't concerned about the <laughs> As soon as I got to the park headquarters, Aaron went and got me a cola. And as soon as I started getting some pop into me and whatnot, I uh, uh, turned around pretty quick. Uh, when you're done, um, it's customary that you take the guide and everyone out for a big hamburger. I thought when we did that, everyone would sit down at a table, but uh, the cultural says, says that Solomon gets to and the three personal guides and all the other guys had to sit in the bus while we all had hamburgers and beer. I felt bad about that, but that's just the way the system is. Uh, then I give you a certificate as well congratulating you. After that, we went back to our motel, freshened up, and uh, told Aaron it's time for a beer. So uh, we went downtown, walked downtown, and had a beer. I think this is the time I probably called my wife, told her, uh, regrettably, I made it. And <laughs> Part of what we did, my daughter and I did, when you go that far and invest that much money and time, I said, well, while, while we're there, I just have a few slides here. We also uh, did a safari in the Serengeti, and we uh, stayed there six days. And um, I did some planning here. I, I knew our painting trip was kind of going to be rough, but when we did the safari, I upgraded us. And we were, I wouldn't say they were five-star places when we stayed, but they were really nice places. And uh, if you go to that part of the world, uh, just take the time, spend the extra money, and see uh, some of the treasures uh, of the world over there. So all in all, we were gone about 14 days. Um, people ask me, will I do it again? I always say no. I'm not a mountain climber. Um, I do Hardy Peak, try to do that once a year, but I have no desire to climb any other mountains. There's other things that I want to do in my life. So like I said at the beginning, you got to do it while you can because we're all going to be sitting in that rocking chair far too soon. And personally, I don't have any, want to have any regrets for places I haven't uh, been able to go or see. So if you have any questions, I'll take them. Yes, ma'am. Did you have any problems running after you climbed? I mean, you said you're a runner. No. Oh, okay. No, I got right back into it. Yes. Uh, what kind of shoes did you wear? Did you have cleats? Did you have leather shoes? Did you have soft shoes? What did you have? They were just a vinyl sole, you know, a vinyl hiking boot <laughs> on, on the bottom, and they were high tops. Um, all I can tell you is I paid about 800 bucks for them. And they were damn good, and I still wear them today. But uh, I didn't have any problems with traction or slipping or anything. They were just really good boots. So you didn't have all that much ice then? Well, at the very top we had ice, but these boots seem to not slip on that. Yes? Could you tell me again, maybe spell the name of the longest route that you take up there that's the best one? The slowest one to get to the top? 
Let me find my notes here. It's the wrong guy. R A N G A I. Yes, sir. Right, you said you had uh, Cadillac style boots. Uh, how much would a three star adventure like you experience cost? I think without airfare, it was probably around six or seven thousand dollars. Without airfare. Without airfare, yeah. Totally with airfare, the uh, climb, and the safari. Oh, that includes uh, the safari. No, oh, okay. no. Um, the total cost for that trip was probably between eighteen and twenty thousand dollars. That's for two people. And I think the safari, that was expensive. It was probably 7000 bucks just for that. Yeah. And I used the same company um, to do the safari with that we did the climb with. It just made a little more sense. It kind of knew the people. You had a, a different guy on the safari. He just drove a land rover around. But it was the same, same group of people. So yeah. maybe you said, but how long did it take? You said you left at midnight to summit. Yes. And then what time did you get? Oh, that's a good question. I meant to mention that. We got up there really quick. We left at midnight, and I think we summited right around 545. And um, Solomon told us that's the fastest he's ever done that. Um, we just went, went fast. Yes? Why didn't you start at 9 or 10 in the morning? Uh, storms move in really quick, and they want to get you up and get you down before the storms move in. Because, you know, maybe you'll get up there... We got up there at about six, and then we were down to the other camp easily by noon. If you get up there at 10 o'clock, you're not gonna get back to that camp till four, and storms just move in really, really fast. They wanna get you off the mountain. Also, he knew that if you were in the dark, you would see the thousand foot drop beside you. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes, Carrie. Recently, I was somewhere doing some walk or something, and the sign that we passed said, going up, remember, going up is optional, coming down is mandatory. <laughs> That's part of it too, you gotta get down. So, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. I, the library told me, I was over here the other day in some library business, that uh, they never had this thing sold out, so the only thing I'm saying to myself is you guys must have a boring life and nothing oh. to do. <laughs> 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 this is what we need to talk about. Thank you.